Okay, guys, uh, John Polamy here, Actionable Intelligence. Today is Saturday, January 29th, and this is a weekly market update. So we're back. Uh, we're feeling about 98% recovered. Um, I don't know what I had, but uh, last week was a short uh, video and I uh, was still not feeling well, but uh, everything's good. Uh, we're back. Um, I noticed that uh, there was quite a few well-wishers and I appreciate uh, people reaching out and uh, offering suggestions on uh, remedies and things like that. Uh, definitely appreciate it. Definitely appreciate this audience. And uh, so we're back and hopefully past this uh, flu and cold season, which has been not uh, the best for us personally this year. So anything that you hear or see on this podcast or on this video is not to be taken as investment advice. I'm not a registered investment advisor. I cannot give individual investment advice. This information is of a general nature. Please do your own due diligence and your own research. It's your money. It's your responsibility. So I think we have to keep talking about oil, right? Um, it's in the news. Um, and Chevron this week came out with earnings, uh, some of the best earnings they've had since about 2014. They still kind of underperformed, but uh, as part of the comments that the CEO made, uh, um, he said, uh, $100 oil is certainly within the realm of what we could see in the next few months, unquote. It's a Chevron CEO. So I don't want to get into the... <clears throat> popular thing of predicting oil prices uh, when they're going to hit 100 or if they're going to hit 100. What I think people should focus on, especially generalist investors, is the fact that, uh, and I really, uh, let me just rewind this a little bit. So I've talked before, there's a couple of guys, uh, well, more than a couple, probably a dozen people that uh, really spend a lot of time on Twitter uh, talking about oil and gas, specifically smaller cap, mid cap oil and gas. These guys have Twitter spaces. I'll put a link to the one they had the other day. I think it was yesterday. It was an eight hour session. These guys just kept going. And uh, at the end, the last hour or so, Eric Nuttall from uh, Nine Point Partners just dropped in. These guys are really starting to attract some good uh, talent. If you want to know about oil and gas, if you want to know, ask questions, if you want to learn, you really need to get dialed in with uh, some of these guys that are, are on uh, Twitter. They spend a lot of time on there. Um, I can't, I mean, like I said, they had like an eight hour session yesterday. I can't be there for eight hours, but I was on and off. And I've learned so many things from these folks. You know, people will call and say, or email me say like what's the best companies you know take a look at which have the most upside i mean these guys have literally turned every one of these small cap mid cap canadian companies upside down and uh you can learn more than you would ever be than i would be ever be able to uh get into um so i'll put a link to that to that twitter spaces i think that's what it's called spaces and uh like i said uh it was a pretty good one yesterday eric nuttle jumped in and gave some insight on a few things. But one of the things I want to stay away from is, I just wanted to throw that out there, but um, one of the things I want to stay away from is like trying to like predict when oil is going to hit $100 a barrel. You know, the fact remains that we have a thesis, we have a view that uh, I think is the correct view, and I think is becoming more mainstream, and they guys talked about this on the spaces the other day too, um, that, you know, we're coming out of this flu and cold season, we're coming out of this um, current variant. Demand is coming back for oil. It's exceeding uh, the previous highs before the pandemic, and yet supply has not been there. And now what we're starting to, was starting to become a realization around the markets is the possibility that uh, the world does not have the capability to supply all of the oil that's going to be called for. Uh, that doesn't mean there's not plenty of oil on the ground. There is. What it means is there hasn't been sufficient investment because the price has been so low 
for so long that we haven't replaced the produced reserves or created new reserves or new production. So um, time and money can fix this. This isn't like something you just buy and hold and forget. This is a commodity and high prices cure uh, high prices and low prices cure low prices. But uh, you have to understand, we've talked about so many times before, understanding the cyclicality, the cycles that these commodities go through, the investment uh, cycles they go through, understanding how it has worked in the past and how it may not work in the future, how shale worked for some period of time and how that may not, it doesn't seem to be coming back this time. What does that mean for conventional producers? Um, what does that mean for offshore? What does that mean for OPEC and national oil companies? You know, you have to factor in the ESG component, the fact that the same amount of funds, uh, loans, and interest from investment firms is not going to be there, uh, at least initially, I think, in the initial stages. Uh, you know, once we get to a certain point, you know, if energy outperforms for a second year in a, in a row, I mean, fund managers, people are not going to have a choice. They're going to have to get involved or they're going to be out of a job. But there's a lot going on is what I'm trying to tell you. So um, do I think you can just buy an ETF and do well? I think the easy money has been made. So I think, you know, you're going to have to get more. Um, if you want to be in this market, you're going to have to really do some work and do some research or at least align yourself and spend some time with some folks that are, are doing that work and uh, at least get some uh, starting points for your research. So um, I think we're gonna go over $100 a barrel this year uh, in price. Uh, I don't know when. Uh, I do think we're gonna make all time high inflation adjusted uh, highs in the oil price. I think that's what's going to be needed to shock the world into reality. Um, and quite frankly, like, uh, you know, Eric Nuttall said on that spaces the other day, you know, I, I don't share the view that oil and gas is going away. Oil and gas is going to be with my, for the, being used in large quantities for the rest of my life, the rest of your children's lives. It's just, <clears throat> if you really take an unbiased view there, it's just almost irreplaceable for many of the things that we use it for. So, um, I think that a lot of people made some poor decisions around invest, investments in policy, especially many governments. And I think that uh, we're going to need a very, very high oil price for a sustained period of time in order to uh, deal with the supply crisis that I believe that we are now starting to experience. I mean, if you look at the backwardation on oil, I mean, it's telling you the market's telling producers to produce more oil. There's not enough current supply. And... Um, it's that's what the message is. And um, do I think there's going to be volatility? Yes. Do I think that we could have, you know, big swings in oil prices and commodity prices? Yes. Do I think that, you know, the possibility of having a recession could affect things? Yes. Uh, these are all things you're going to have to take into account. But I think over the next three to five years, I think people are going to be shocked at uh, where the oil price ends up. There's tremendous, tremendous uh, value still here. So again, uh, here's Bloomberg Energy. You know, supply constraints are becoming the story of 2022. Um, unless the need for oil slows dramatically, the prospect of inadequate supply and triple digit prices is real. Um, I didn't have a chance to go to all these articles or behind the paywall. Sometimes I can get to them from uh, archives. But uh, this is what you're seeing now from Bloomberg Energy. <clears throat> the the discussion around inadequate supply is now becoming mainstream. And as that, you know, that was what we thought would happen as this year goes on, as more and more folks uh, come on board with this, with this type of view. Um, here's, here's a chart from HFI Research on Seeking Alpha. I think you should follow this person. They do a lot of good work. Um, U.S. implied oil demand at all-time high for this time of the year. Here's 2022. You can see we're at an all-time high for this time of year uh, for the uh, U.S. product supplied, petroleum products. Um, we're seeing this not just in the U.S., but other places. Uh, we've seen India, China, anecdotal reports from different countries that they have already exceeded their pre-pandemic um, and have made all-time highs in oil demand.
So this is something I want to talk about. I've touched on this a couple times. I think there's a tremendous opportunity here. Um, a lot of people have not uh, delved into this um, or thought about it. I'll be talking about the uh, Halliburton conference call later on in this call, which was very positive. And now that's two of the largest oil field service providers, both giving you um, outstanding results and outstanding forecasts going forward. But this is uh, from Tavi Costa uh, at Crescat Capital. I love their charts. Uh, and what they're basically showing you here is that US oil and gas exploration and production, the last time that oil was at current prices of you know, $87 WTI, this was the CapEx that was uh, at that level of oil price. Here's where your cap aggregate CapEx is for 2022. Um, basically, uh, back in 2014, during the really bull shale thing deal, your CapEx was three times larger. And, you know, it led to a oversupply. Now, I'm not suggesting that we're going to go back to the all-time highs for, you know, CapEx, but we don't need to, right? Because we've talked about this before. The oil field services companies have really atrophied during this downturn. Many of them went bankrupt. Another one just filed for bankruptcy on Friday. It was a geoscience corporation. It's not the one held in the portfolio, but it's another one that had already been in bankruptcy and exited once <coughs> and then um, ended up back there. So, I mean, what I'm, what I'm saying is, is as, as CapEx does increase and it will increase as prices go higher, stay higher, sustained, you will see uh, oil executives and company executives become more, um, bra not brazen, but uh, confident in the oil price. And that will lead to decisions to spend more money. I mean, a lot of the independents and private companies are already drilling and spending money, but that isn't, isn't what's going to drive another up cycle in oil field services. Um, it's going to take, you know, the really big money spenders and that they will come back. Uh, as long as the price doesn't collapse, uh, they will come back because this is a depleting asset and you have to replace it. But I think this is a tremendous opportunity. I mean, I put a chart up here the other day that showed a scatter well, maybe it was two or three weeks ago, it was a scatter plot. It basically showed that at current oil prices, the OIH is typically three to four times higher than it currently is right now. So the OIH being the uh, oil field services ETF, and that's just a broad basket. Uh, I think we I think you can do much better by picking individual stocks in the sector. And I will say that the stocks uh, in the portfolio that are focused on oil field services have had some rallies recently. They're starting to wake up. Things are starting to happen. The money's flowing. We're waiting for reports to come in. The initial reports for the fourth quarter for one of our companies was outstanding. Um, we haven't seen the full year results, but uh, preliminary look good. And like I said, Schlumberger, we talked about it last week, and we're going to go over Halliburton this week. Both of them uh, produced outstanding results. And like I said, gave very, very positive guidance going forward for spending on um, oil field services. So let's get into the Halliburton Q4 co uh, conference call comments. Suggest you uh, go and read the transcript. It's on uh, Seeking Alpha, or you can go to the website. I'm sure that Halliburton has a recording. But uh, these are just some comments that I, <coughs> that I picked up out of the, uh, out of the uh, transcript. Um, 2021 finished strong for Halliburton, and I'm excited about the accelerating up cycle as we enter 2022. That's uh, from the CEO of Halliburton. That basically mirrors what the CEO of Schlumberger said, that they see an accelerating up cycle in the 2022. Um, we have an effective value proposition and benefit from increasing activity both in North America and international markets. At the same time, we see improving service pricing in both markets. So you have increase in activity and improving service uh, pricing. So that's what you want to see, right? That's how a recovery works, more business and at a higher price. The impact of several years of underinvestment in new production is now apparent and the structural requirement to invest around the well bore is crystal clear. This is what we've been talking about. Uh, this is the thesis. 
we see increasing customer urgency and a pivot back to what creates value for Halliburton. Uh, they go on to say on this slide, um, we expect a busy 2022 in North America, given a strong commodity price environment. We anticipate North America customer spending to grow more than 25% year on year. We believe the highest increase will come from private operators. We talked about that uh, uh, earlier in the presentation. We believe the highest increase will come from private operators. Public EMPs will continue to prioritize returns while delivering production into a supportive market. The North America completions market is approaching 90% utilization and Halliburton is sold out. I mean, if that's not like, now you have to remember, you know, we're sold out on this lower base. I mean, they, they have shrunk their business over the last several years. And so getting this thing ramped up, that's where your price, that's where your pricing power is there, right? And so they'll be looking to, um, as I say here, pricing for our fracturing fleets is moving higher across the board. Um, and so we're seeing this type of language in many of these companies. And I don't think the general market's picked up on this vibe yet. I mean, we don't even have general investor attention in the actual EMP producers. Forget about the service providers. So this is why it's still, I think, a tremendous opportunity and why um, I think this could really be the where services will possibly outperform the EMP producers this year. There is no doubt the much anticipated multi-year IP cycle is now underway. North America production growth remains capped by operators' capital discipline, while meaningful international production growth is challenged by years of underinvestment. Energy demand has proven its resilience, fueled by pent-up economic growth and a global desire to return to normalcy. This is a fantastic set of conditions for Halliburton. So <clears throat> there you have it, right? Uh, unless you have a recession and the oil price gets, you know, drops by a third. I don't, I, I mean, it's, you've got now two of the largest um, oil field service providers, both telling you that we've now entered an up cycle uh, and they expect it to be a sustained up cycle. So um, this is very positive and uh, relative to where it should be, or what has been in the past, I wouldn't say should, uh, but I think there's a real disconnect of where, you know, the perception of where oil field services are down here and where they typically are at this point, uh, at this particular oil price, uh, based on the past, uh, is an opportunity to uh, be a buyer. And you can't go wrong. If you want to just buy the ETF, you can do that. You can delve down into the smaller companies. Uh, that takes a little bit more work and research, but uh, I think there's tremendous opportunity down there. You know, I wouldn't be opposed to just buying, you know, the ETF. If you're a generalist investor and just want to put some capital to work and don't have the time or inclination to pour through all of the various financials. So um, just wanted to talk about the general market here. Uh, I, I, I don't really know. I mean, this recent upsets with the Federal Reserve and supposedly what they're going to do, or what they're not going to do. Um, but here is something from Sediment Trader. We're now up to 44% of NASDAQ securities cut in half from their highs. That's in the top 7% of all days since 1999. Lots of crap on that exchange, but at least now they're half as crappy as they were before. So um, I guess one of the things I would be thinking about is a short covering rally. I think a lot of people made some easy money shorting a lot of stocks. Um, I think what you will find is some of the most violent rallies you'll see in the stock market are during, not during bull markets, but during bear market rallies as short covering takes place. And as money comes back in, as people think that's the bottom, um, but that's typically not how it works. <clears throat> I don't short. I'm not advocating. What I'm trying to show you is, is that the, the view that some guys smarter than us had of a violent rotation uh, from away from these crappy growth companies that were just growing for the sake of growing into value companies, into cash producing businesses um, is happening. So, uh, but I think that the overall market is not down 44% because you are being held up by, you know, five or six big stocks, Apple, Google, Facebook, that kind of stuff. They haven't really 
gotten taken out to the woodshed yet. I suspect if uh, this rotation continues, you will see that eventually. So wanted to point this out, copper is still looking good. You know, one of the things you really need to pay attention to um, if the copper price is not like coming down, uh, economic growth prospects are probably decent. Um, this is a big ESG component, copper for the electrification. Uh, copper, along with many other the metals, I think nickel has at, been at a recent uh, multi-year high. Cobalt been at a record uh, multi-year high. Um, a lot of these metals, nobody's really paying attention to. But if you look at the global raw materials indexes, it made a new all-time high, I believe, last week. And so what is Bloomberg saying about copper? It says it has a bright future as a commodity. That'll be the key to the energy transition. I mean, here we go again. You know, I'm not going to get into that. I just laugh about it. Um, I basically just say that heads we win, tails we win more. It doesn't matter if they want to put billions and trillions of dollars into this energy transition. It has to be done with copper. We've talked about it many, many times in the past. Um, I think copper is going to surprise to the upside over the next few years. The head grades and the ability to find new mines has just not uh, it's been the same across the entire commodity complex. It's not just oil and gas. It's uh, these metals also. Um, Jeremy Grantham, co-founder of Boston Asset Manager GMO, sounded the alarm about quickening inflation and slower growth, highlighting a shortage of raw materials, including a dearth of cheap copper. Longtime bull Jeffrey Curry at Goldman Sachs described copper as, quote, the most strategically important commodity, unquote, given its role as the, quote, new oil. The firm's 12-month target is a record $12,000 a ton. Uh, Richard Adkerson at Freeport McMoran, which is a big copper miner, said the task of ramping up supply to meet growing demand is getting harder as societies resist new mines <coughs> and politicians seek a bigger share of profits. Indeed. The, and here you go right here, right? The Biden administration quashed a project that would have produced copper as well as nickel and cobalt citing issues with the lease. So it's going to be very difficult, I think, to have an energy transition if you don't have the requisite metals and requisite supplies. And then you have these the governments, which are only, you know, the Western governments that are pushing this mostly um, doing. You can't call for an energy transition and then stop the mining of the materials that are needed. I mean, it just shows a lack of being a capable person or somebody that understands what's really going on. I mean, I, I guess. These people think they're just going to import all this stuff from the third world. Um, I don't buy it. Um, talking about food, you know, I, I pay a lot of attention to weather. I subscribe to a service that talks a lot about worldwide weather, you know, talks about the recent volcano in Tonga, what's going to happen there. Um, different weather anomalies, different El Ninos, La Ninas, what that means. Um, and so this is again from Bloomberg, right? Uh, Brazil, the world's largest soybean producer and exporter will fail to deliver a record crop this year. Uh, La Nina halts Brazil's soy record as analysts slash forecast. The world's largest soybean producer and exporter will fail to deliver a record crop this year. <coughs> um, you know, one of the things I think was taken for granted by a lot of people in the world over the last 10 years or so has been the outstanding growing conditions we've enjoyed. It's allowed us to have an abundance of carryovers in our grains and has kept a lid on food prices. You know, we may be entering a period of weather volatility um, and this could, this could uh, affect um, crop yields. Uh, certainly something that is going to affect crop yields is the ability of, you know, reasonable priced for and availability of fertilizers, you know, higher nitrogen prices could lead to falling yields. Um, crop yields could be cut in half without nitrogen products. You know, if you look at the <clears throat> urea and ammonia prices, they're pushing multi-year highs and we've seen uh, reports anecdotal of uh, folks, you know, being told that there will be, uh, there, there could be some shortages. So um, now maybe not so much in um, the United States or maybe Europe, but, um, <clears throat> you know, these developing countries, you know, uh, it's already 
being talked about North Korea again, you know, they don't have the money to, to pay these record prices for fertilizer. So the challenge is you have to produce a certain amount of human waste for fertilizer. I mean, it sounds morbid and gross, but this is what people get reduced to in some of these countries. And <clears throat> just assuming that there's going to be sufficient uh, food for everyone on the planet uh, is not necessarily something that is going to um, happen. And, you know, food prices, I think, if they go up for people in the US or Europe, yes, you'll crab about it. We can absorb a lot of the cost. But in a lot of these societies, as I've said before, a lot of these people are spending the half or or even almost all of their money just on their daily food supplies. And so when the price of food goes up 30 or 40 or 50%, this is how revolutions start. Here's an anecdote that I thought was interesting. Ties turn to crocodile meat as pork prices soar. Thailand turns to crocodile meat as pork prices rise. It sounds like the food crisis is escalating and high fertilizer prices haven't even really had a chance to kick in yet. I'm increasingly leaning towards a 70 style stagflation scenario for the next few years. This is Josh Young at Bison. Um, I didn't really uh, look at the, this is anecdotal, of course, but um, this is what happens, right? I mean, um, livestock needs grains, grains are at, in shortages or record high prices. People are going to turn to other protein sources, if you will. Um, I don't know if I'd be wanting to eat crocodile meat, but uh, this is, you know, this is, how these things start, these trends start, right? We start identifying these anecdotes and they're not just one-offs. We notice an anecdote here, an anecdote there, this country, that country, and actually next thing you know, it's on Bloomberg and it's front page news. And we've already spotted the trend, you know, a year in advance. And that's uh, what I think is one of the advantages that we have and with the network that we have that, that allows us to, get ahead of these issues well before the mainstream figures out what's going on, because that really is the key to having the information before anyone else. You're not, you know, you have to have a, <coughs> an information advantage that allows you to, you know, position yourself in something before it becomes mainstream. That's, that's one of our main um, selling points here. All right, guys, that's it for this week. Uh, I'm back. Um, still, you can tell I still have a little bit of residual frog in my throat there when I'm trying to talk. You get, keep drinking water here and coughing, but we're back. And uh, like I said, uh, I'll put in the, a link to that uh, Twitter spaces if I can find it. Um, you guys need to identify the guys that run that and then uh, start following them on Twitter. They, they have these spaces all the time. The one guy... I can't even pronounce these names these guys have, but uh, the one guy does like every Sunday a uh, training session, like how to value uh, energy companies, things like that. I mean, they're very, they're very well done. And uh, these people are just volunteering their information. You know, plus when you get on these Twitter spaces, you can, you know, you can ask questions. Um, they're bringing on more and more um, mainstream, you know, CEOs and things like that. So these guys are getting a following. And uh, you're going to learn a lot if you're interested in energy and oil and gas, especially where I think there's tremendous value still in Canadian small cap and mid cap, along with uh, really no one's even talking about yet a lot of the services companies. They are talking some service companies up in Canada, but the overall uh, industry. So uh, definitely uh, take a look at that if you get a chance. All right, guys, that's it for that this week. Uh, appreciate you listening. We'll talk to you next week.